Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Art of Adaptation. So a few weeks ago I was wandering around my apartment brainstorming ideas for episodes when I looked over at my bookshelf, and there was a certain set of seven books looking back at me. And at first, I dismissed the idea of doing anything on them. After all, what more could be said about them? But as I thought about it, there's kind of a dearth of serious analysis on this franchise. Especially now that it's been a few years and we can look back on it as a whole. For the most part, it's either established film or literature critics dismissively saying, I don't get the hype, or fans remembering their favorite parts through rose-colored glasses. And that's pretty shocking when you consider how big this franchise is. I'm probably not the person to fix that problem, but I've got this web series about adaptations that needs content, so... I guess what I'm trying to say is... Welcome to the Harry Potter Power Not Really an Hour, a seven-part retrospective. So real quick, here's what this series isn't. It isn't the definitive analysis of all things Harry Potter. I'm just looking at the books and the movies, because I could spend years digging into everything Harry Potter related. This also isn't going to be a deep, granular analysis of either the books or movies as books and movies. Obviously I'll talk about stuff in them and offer my opinions, but I'm interested in how they relate as adaptation and source material more than their innate quality. And lastly, this isn't a books versus movies discussion. I'll go on record saying that overall the books books are better than the movies, but the comparative quality isn't the focus here. So we're going to go book and movie by book and movie and dig into them. So today we're going to start at the very beginning and go over Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's or Philosopher's Stone, depending on which side of the pond you live on, starting with a quick overview of the basics. So one of the main theses of this series is going to be that the targeted age group is around Harry's age. So Sorcerer's Stone, where Harry is at his youngest, is targeting youngest of all the books, and therefore has the simplest story. What do I mean by that, asks no one in particular? Well, Harry Potter scenes can generally be categorized into two types. School scenes and evil plot scenes that, with the exception of the Half-Blood Prince, have to do with the subtitle. And it's not necessarily a binary, it's more of a gradient with very few scenes going to the far extremes. Now Deathly Hallows is doing something a little different, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So when I say Sorcerer's Stone keeps things simple, this is part of what I'm talking about. For the most part it keeps things on the school side of the spectrum, with only a few scenes near the end really getting over more towards the evil plot side of things. This means we can keep Voldemort's evil plan nice and simple. Which is important because Sorcerer's Stone has to disseminate a large amount of information to an audience that is still very much learning how to learn. So any information it can get away with not giving us here and now, it saves for later. As an example, we don't learn Voldemort's motivation in this first book. He's just the evil guy. Instead, we're simply here to immerse ourselves in the world and enjoy the kooky atmosphere, which provides an interesting challenge for this first movie. That sort of let's just relax and enjoy where we are setup works much better in a book than a movie. You see, in a book we have access to the internal life of our characters and can take as long as we want on a specific scene. Movies, by contrast, are temporally locked, and are largely built on a series of actions, especially for blockbusters. This is part of why Quidditch tends to work better in the books than in the movies, as the Quidditch games tend to be more about how Harry feels during the game than the actual playing of the game itself. The movies largely attempt to work around this by focusing more on the evil plots to be foiled than on Harry's school life. Because of these factors, the first movie feels a little padded. This starts working better in the later movies, where the evil plot is more interwoven in the school storylines. Though sometimes the school feels more like set dressing than an integral part of our characters' lives. But we can talk more about that in later sections. Instead, let's move on to the lightning round. So this section, which will probably be in every one of these videos, is essentially a place to put minor thoughts. Thoughts that either aren't that important, or I can't flesh out into a full section, or both. But at the same time, I feel they're worth mentioning. So here we go. Peeves the Poltergeist ends up sitting the movies out, which is fine. While he's fun, he doesn't really add much to the overall plot. He mainly exists as a way to help illustrate Hogwarts as a place where everyone can find a home, and to illustrate the contrast between Hogwarts as a fun, chaotic environment versus the suffocating order of Number 4 Privet Drive. Both points are illustrated elsewhere, so while it kind of sucks that his character is just omitted, ultimately there isn't a lot he would have added. The John Williams score is great. Surprising, I know. 
It's this wonderful combination of mysterious, playful, whimsical, adventurous, and sincere. Pretty much the perfect music for Harry Potter. Nitwit, Blubber, Oddment, and Tweak. I feel like we could have made room for that. Speaking of things left out of the opening feast, the movie drops two songs. The Hogwarts School song is quite funny, but probably wouldn't have worked as well in a movie. The idea of everyone singing the same song to a different tune is amusing in theory, but actually having to hear it would likely be more annoying than anything else. So that's fine, but we also drop the Sorting Hat song, which I feel would have been good to keep just because it provides a useful breakdown of what defines each house, and a sort of primer on where Hogwarts comes from, which is weirdly absent from the movie. The snake Harry releases is changed from a boa constrictor to a Burmese python. Not a real issue, but I miss that he calls Harry Amigo. And lastly, they drop the Riddle Room that Snape sets up to protect the stone. Which is a shame, as it's a wonderful illustration of how Snape differs from the other teachers, and it really lets Hermione show off her skills more than defeating the Devil's Snare. With that out of the way, let's do some more substantive analysis. And today I'm feeling traditional, so let's start at the beginning. So one of the main ways the movies differ is that they tend to greatly abbreviate the prologues, or else skip them entirely. You see, readers are willing to let a book take as long as it wants to tell its story, as long as the pacing's good. But most movies have about, at most, three hours to tell their stories, so they really have to get to the point. In addition, novels have a greater degree of control over the flow of time. They're free to jump around between, rush through, and elongate events as necessary. Movies, on the other hand, are generally stuck working at a one-to-one -one rate for time. This means books tend to have a slight edge when trying to communicate large amounts of specific information or events over a large period of time. The first movie sticks out in that it has what feels like the longest prologue. It still does cut out a lot, like a fun intro where we follow Vernon around on the day Voldemort is defeated and muggles keep noticing weird wizard-related stuff as everyone celebrates. In addition, we skip a lot of scenes about Harry's childhood that help establish how weird things keep happening to him. But we still get the most important scene at the zoo. Harry's interaction with the snake does a good job of giving us a glimpse into Harry's worldview and feelings. Because as the robot devil taught us, you can't just have your characters say how they feel. It's a little on the nose for adults, but it works well for kids. It does this because in many ways the first prologue is the most important. As it has the most to set up. But overall I would say dropping the prologue elements work to the movie's advantage. Well, maybe. I keep going back and forth on this. You see, looking back on it, Harry's relationship with the Dursleys is... uncomfortable. Ugh, I really wanted to save shit getting real till later in the series, but here we go. It's abusive, plain and simple. And the fact that all these adults who claim to really care about Harry seem to know about it, but don't do anything until very late in the series. As a kid, I don't think I noticed as much because the feelings Harry has are pretty universal, even if the specifics of his situation, thankfully, are not. So as a kid, I related to the feeling that people with power in my life weren't fair and that no one seemed to understand me, because I was also between the ages of 10 and 18 at the time. But looking at it as an adult, I'm left troubled by this. And I'm not sure whether the movies are helped because this troubling aspect of the story is downplayed, or whether it feels too much like the movies are trying to sweep this very real, very important issue under the rug. Overall though, I would say Harry Potter as a franchise is not fatally weakened by this. You see, at its core, the story of Harry is the story of overcoming problems. And this abuse, like the other issues Harry faces, seem less interesting to Rowling and the movie's production team than the way he overcomes it. So if anything, I think Harry Potter is strengthened by the inclusion of real issues. As this message of resilience and not allowing ourselves to be defined by our baggage is a powerful one, and one an entire generation heard loud and clear and have worked very hard to take to heart. Okay, that got serious, so let's all take a break and talk about something a little lighter, shall we? So one of the more common pieces of negative criticism I've heard in regards to the Sorcerer's Stone movie is that the cinematography isn't good. And I agree. I'm not sure I'd agree with people who call it lazy, though. Partly because I don't really like that criticism in most cases. Making a movie, or writing a book, or illustrating a comic takes a lot of work, and in general I feel like something else is usually going wrong when a work or some aspect of it feels lazy. In this specific case, I feel like they weren't being lazy so much as they had an idea that was sound in concept but fell short in execution. 
Sorcerer's Stone, the book, is the most simply written, because as I said, the targeted audience is at its youngest. So when faced with the choice between stylism and readability, Rowling prioritized readability. And I feel like Chris Columbus was trying to recreate the simple language of the book in film language. Does it work? Not really. While that's fine in concept, in practice this tends to make the shots feel static and overly similar. There are some good shots, but for the most part they all feel like they could have been more effective. This is exacerbated by the choice to try and make the wizarding world feel real in a cinematic sense. Which doesn't necessarily mean realistic, there are still wizards, witches, goblins, and ghosts in our story. But there is a noticeable lean towards realism, which somewhat conflicts with the text of Harry Potter. One of the main motifs in the early books is the contrast between the muggle world and the wizard one. This is partly because we're seeing things from Harry's perspective. Like, the books may not be written in first person, but Harry is undoubtedly our POV character. The wizarding world is so different from Harry's experience in the muggle one that it almost feels surreal to him. And not just because there are talking hats and magic potions. He goes from a world where at best people ignore him, but most hate him to a world where he's a celebrity and where a stranger he meets on a train will knit him a sweater for Christmas. The simple cinematography and the attempt at realism undercut the intended contrast. Overall, I would say things are played too safe, but I wouldn't call the film lazy. While the movie fails to take full advantage of cinematography and production design, there are other tools the movie takes better advantage of. I already mentioned how good the film's score is, but there's also the cast. Actors are generally creative people and can help breathe life and complexity into a character. Now here, I'm less interested in our young cast. They're all fine, but don't really add or subtract much from the way their characters are portrayed in the books. Rupert Grint and Tom Felton have the easiest times as Ron and Malfoy respectively, because their characters are kind of the simplest of book one, at least among our principal characters. Ron's just sort of a good-hearted doofus and Malfoy's just a d in the first book. Emma Watson and Daniel Radcliffe get to struggle a little more, not because they're worse actors, but because they're handed tougher characters. Especially in Watson's case, as she's tasked with playing a character who's supposed to come off as more than a little annoying. But we'll talk more about her and the rest of the younger cast in later parts. For now though, let's talk about our adults. They face an interesting challenge in this first movie. In the first book, the adult characters, most of whom will be recurring characters, are kept at their broadest. Part of this is a reflection of Harry's point of view. He's 11, so he's not the best at picking up on the complex inner lives of people around him. But it's also part of making sure the world is easily understood by kids. So the teacher's personalities are for the most part kept simple here and developed over time. But this leaves the adult cast with very simple characters to play that would definitely be made more interesting with the right performance. And overall, the cast succeeds and then some. First off, Dame Maggie Smith. Can we all just take a moment to appreciate her for the bamf she is? I mean, later in this series she would film through shingles and breast cancer. Oh, and she's pretty much perfect at playing a deceptively complex character. Because unlike Snape, who can be mostly unlikable from start to finish, or Hagrid, who has to be mostly likable, McGonagall has to be a mix of both. She's very strict, but clearly loves and values her students. It has to be inconceivable that she has ever relaxed for longer than it takes to get what few hours of sleep are necessary to live, while also clearly having gone through some wild younger years. She must clearly only care about what things are truly important, but yes, that must absolutely include defeating those damn Slytherins and winning the f***ing Quidditch Cup for Gryffindor. And Smith perfectly gets all of this across. You couldn't design a better actress for this role. But despite basically being born for this role, Smith still clearly gives it her all. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank Maggie Smith for that, because McGonagall was always my favorite of the teachers, and I got to see her on the big screen, not just an actress playing her. Oh, and speaking of people who are perfect for a role, but somehow are even better than you'd think, Alan Rickman as Severus Snape. The sadly late, but nevertheless great Rickman basically made this character for the first movie. Snape spins basically the entirety of Sorcerer's Stone as a Scooby-Doo-esque red herring, and we're really left with only the promise that he'll be more interesting in later books. But it's Alan Rickman, so even though he's having to work with a fairly flat character in this first movie, yes, I know he's more interesting later, but I'll talk about that when we get there. He nonetheless instantly communicates so much about his character just from his attitude and how he carries himself. We instantly feel like we know who this guy is, but still want to learn more about him. 
But not every actor here needs to add a lot to their characters, some just need to perfectly embody them. And we've got two who I think do that. Well, technically three, but we'll talk about Molly next time. Robbie Coltrane makes an exceptional Hagrid. I mean, it's not surprising he gets the comedy elements down, even though he's not given the most interesting material in this first movie. But he does a great job with the heartfelt moments Hagrid has too. As Harry's cool uncle, Hagrid has to deeply care about Harry, but maybe not be the best choice to take care of him. Robbie Coltrane's pretty much perfect for that, and the costuming and makeup are spot on. Also, there's Richard Harris as Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. Now, unfortunately, Harris is only in the first two movies as he sadly passed away, but he really was well suited for Dumbledore, especially as he's presented in the first few books. He's just able to project this sort of gentle, welcoming, quiet warmth. Remember, Dumbledore is Harry's surrogate grandfather, and more than any other character, with the exception of perhaps Sirius Black and Molly Weasley, he's set up as the counterpoint to the Dursleys. In fact, if you go back and read his first scene in the book, it's really explicit with this. And Harris seemed to really understand that. When we get to Prisoner of Azkaban, I'll talk about Michael Gambon's take on Dumbledore, but for now I'll just say that I don't strongly prefer one or the other. But Harris's Dumbledore has a certain wisdom to him that is pretty much perfect for his appearance in book one. So as we stand here today and look back on the massive success of the Harry Potter franchise, I feel like it's prudent to try and understand why Harry Potter connected so strongly with people. So is there a secret weapon that turned a series of books into a full-on cultural moment? Well, yes and no. I'm not sure there's one singular factor, but there is one I can think of that's worth acknowledging here in part one. Harry Potter is escapist fantasy. And there's a certain meta-narrative synchronicity to the fact that Harry is also escaping. In fact, assuming we're kids as we're reading this, we're all escaping the same thing. Not necessarily in the specifics for most of us, again, thankfully so. But the feeling that your parents, guardians, teachers, or whatever adult authority figures are in your life are unfair, out of touch, or even downright cruel is a pretty universal feeling for kids around that age. And through Harry, we got to vicariously escape that. But I also feel the way Harry escapes spoke to us. And I say us because I was right at that age when the books and movies were coming out. I remember as a kid having it drilled into my head over and over that the path to a better life is only truly available through scholastic achievement. And while teachers who remember me might not believe me when I say this, we heard that loud and clear. So the fantasy of getting to go to an amazing school that teaches an interesting subject with wonderful teachers and lifelong friends, and you'll find that you do really well there, and when you're done you get to go live in this more interesting and just plain better world. Yeah, that's basically catnip for those of us who were there for the initial releases of these books. And that's before we add the adventure and the magic. So I think I'll call it there for now. If you guys liked this video, please click the like button, and if you want to see parts 2 through 7 of this little trip down memory lane, please don't forget to subscribe. Next week sadly won't be the retrospective on Chamber of Secrets, as I'll need time to reread the book, rewatch the movie, and write the script. Next week though I will have the top 5 list of games that I think would be most difficult to turn into movies. See you guys then.